Okay, so today we're going to be talking about different sorts of respiratory medications that we can use. And before we get into that, as I'm going to further emphasize, we must rely on the receptors. The receptors tell us what they do, how these drugs work, our adverse effects, our contraindications, and I highly advise using a drug template. From the students that I've been able to tutor with, using a drug template and organizing drugs by classes has been very efficient in their studying, and it's a recommended practice by a lot of the faculty, so I highly recommend that you do this. Now, before we get into different drugs for asthma, asthma and COPD are some of our very common respiratory illnesses, and we also need to know what sorts of medications we give to them since they're very common. So for knowledge that you need to know before getting into the differences between the different types of drug classes, remember it's drug classes, it's not drugs, we need to talk about two different types of drugs that we can use for asthma. So we have relievers, which are quick acting rescue drugs. This is in a situation like an asthma attack or exercise induced asthma. These are short acting bronchodilators. Okay, that's an example. Those can be your beta 2 adrenergic agonists because remember they work on the lungs and cause bronchodilation or those anticholinergic agents like epitropium. Why? Because as you remembered in my previous lecture and if you haven't watched it, please watch my autonomic nervous system drugs. Um, this is anti-slud, right? And a part of this anti-slud is anti-lacrimation, defecation, urination, and it kind of stimulates a similar like sympathetic response, which causes bronchodilation. So anticholinergics, which is basically anti-parasympathetic response, is going to help with breathing. So the beta-2 adrenergic agonists and the anticholinergic agents are considered relievers used in situations of emergencies or something that we need to work quickly, such as exercise-induced asthma or an asthmatic attack. Controllers are slightly different. Controllers are used for long-term daily management of asthma. Okay, so we're gonna have long-acting bronchodilators, which include beta-2 adrenergic agonists. Why? Because they work on the lungs. Methylexines, which is like theophylline, is another long-acting bronchodilator that we can use. We have chromalin sodium, leukotriene inhibitors, and anti-IG monoclonal antibodies as other classes of medications that you can use to control long-term asthma. So like I said, you're going to differentiate between relievers and controllers. That's really going to help with narrowing down your understanding of how to use these drugs. So asthma is a type 1 hypersensitivity, which means that it basically causes an inflammatory response to some sort of irritant. That's why it's mediated by these Ig antibodies. And if you remember, I just said in a really long way, anti-Ig monoclonal antibodies, because asthma is mediated by this idea of IgE or these antibodies that cause an inflammation response. So for long-term maintenance, we can use IgE. So Without further ado, like I said, asthma is an inflammatory response related to some sort of irritant. And it usually can happen very quickly, and a late response might be more hours, so it really depends. But either way, an asthmatic attack is caused by some sort of irritant. Okay, so with that being said, there's an emphasis for daily treatment for this underlying inflammation, which gets into our controllers. Another controller that we'll see is steroids being used in the management of daily treatment for asthma because it helps with inflammation. It's a part of the controllers. So asthma is a disease. You can have attacks and it's chronic with an underlying inflammatory process. So we need certain medication, and like I said, rescue medications, or what I like to call relievers, or preventative medications, which I consider the controllers, okay? So sympathetic nervous system is one of the systems that has drugs acting on certain receptors 
that we can use for the relievers. As I mentioned before, those beta twos, because they work on the lungs, we see them here. That's why they're a part of our reliever or our bronchodilator class. And we also have, what did I say? Those anticholinergics, which is part of this parath parasympathetic nervous system acting on either the muscarinic or nicotinic receptors, which is really important because this anticholinergic agent, um, because it's anti-slud, it's anti-sympathetic, it's going to help with bronchodilation. So, like I said, we have a lot of these sympathetic acting nervous system drugs. Why? Because of that bronchodilator response that I was emphasizing in my last video, but I'm going to further emphasize more. So other things that we need to watch out for is increased blood pressure, increased heart rate, vasoconstriction, and decrease renal and GI blood flow because this is what the sympathetic nervous system does. As I mentioned in my previous lecture, sympathetic nervous system causes increased blood pressure, increased heart rate. And those are some of the adverse effects that you get as a result of taking those medications. In addition, decreased renal and GI blood flow. This is why it is so important to know the sympathetic nervous system, the receptors, because all of this comes back. These drugs just don't go away even after you learn about them. So like I said, please go back and watch if you haven't already. It will also help with your understanding and your learning moving forward. So these are just the different routes, how long they take to work if you're doing sub-Q, IM, IV, but a lot of these are inhalation. So three to five minutes, going to be very quick. So epinephrine, as I mentioned in my previous lecture, which I'm going to mention now, works on those alpha and beta receptors in the adrenergic nervous system or the sympathetic nervous system. Therapeutic uses include circulatory support, treatment of anaphylactic shock or shock in general. Why? Because when we have shock, we have decreased perfusion to the organs, and we might have some hypotension. So we give the epinephrine to increase the blood flow, increase the blood pressure, and get perfusion back. And as I'm going to further emphasize, all of these syn sympathetic nervous system drugs are going to cause tremors and tachycardia and high blood pressure and arrhythmias. Everything that I said that we would see is here. So please keep a note of that. Tachycardia, tachycardia is one of those huge symptoms, especially in these drugs that are we going to be talking about next. So just keep that in mind with these sympathetic acting drugs, especially the ones that work on the alphas and the betas, that tachycardia. Okay, which is increased heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute. So beta-2 agonists, meaning they mimic the beta-2 receptors. Remember, we said beta-2 works in the lungs, so we're going to have a bronchodilation or an effect that's going to expand the lungs, okay? So bronchospasms are relieved when you use these beta-2s. Histamine release or that inflammatory response is inhibited, okay? And then we have ciliary motility is going to be increased, which is aligning in your lungs, but the most important thing is that the bronchospasm is relieved, okay? So, beta-2 agonist examples include albuterol and le levobutyl. I don't know how to say that, but whatever, albuterol, our most common one, our prototypical one. So, they're inhaled and they're short acting. Albuterol is an example of a short acting bronchodilator used as a reliever drug. I said before, there's the long acting ones are the controllers and this is a short acting beta-2 agonist that is used for those asthmatic attacks. So it's inhaled and it's short acting and prevention of an asthmatic episode that can be exercise induced or they're having an asthma attack for short-term bronchospasm. This is what we give in an emergency. So if we had a nursing question and the patient comes in, when they're having an asthma attack or exercise-induced asthma and the provider ordered these medications, which one do you ex expect the provider to say to give or which one do you expect to give as a nurse? And you should give the albuterol because short-acting and it's going to help relieve. 
Now, formeterol and salmeterol are long-acting beta 2s. They're used for long-term control of asthma. Also, terbutaline is also used. It's another one of those agonists. And as you're seeing, all of these drugs end in this T-E-R-O-L ending. That's how you should remember which drugs work on the lungs. So albuterol, levetorol, formeterol, salmeterol, there's an ending and that can help you distinguish what this drug is used for. Even if you can't necessarily remember which one's short and which one's long, at least you know it's a respiratory acting medication. But you need to know, especially for this exam, which one's short and which one's long. But for a future note, it's also good to know the endings. But with the formeterol, semeterol, and terbutaline, those are long-term acting. But see, terbutaline, something that I want you to know about that drug is that it can delay preterm labor. So just, just keep that in mind because it's going to be a, an important medication that you're going to learn in your OB class, which you are going to take next semester. So even if you can't remember it now, it will be good for the future. Okay, so that's the differences between these two, okay? And like I said, they're all beta 2s. So we really, really want to also watch out for that tachycardia. That is an adverse effect that is very common, as well as those tremors that might be on your exam, okay? So complications, what did we just say? Tachycardia, right? Due to these drugs, the way they act, because they're sympathetic stimulating, we're going to have tachycardia right? We also want to watch out for their pulses. Remember, these drugs stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. Therefore, if it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, we can have an increase in heart rate, and that might not be good, right? We also want to avoid caffeine, another important teaching point to our patients because of the receptors and where they work. Also, like I said, the tremors and the tachycardia are the most important things. So we need to watch out for that and inform our patient that this might happen. So they should be taking their pulse regularly on these medications. Other nursing considerations, as I mentioned in my ANS lecture, you should be using a drug template. So if I were you, I would write one for short acting bronchodilators, put the example of albuterol, the mechanism of action that it works on the beta 2s, what it's used for, which is the short, um, the exercise induced asthma or asthma attacks and things like that. And then putting out my nursing considerations. Remember the adverse effects, the conjure indications, all that stuff is going to be the same. Just the differences of which one's short acting and which one's long acting and where I use them. That's why it's so important to know the class. Cause if you know the class, it tells you a lot about the drug and then you don't have to memorize as much either. So with nursing administration, Things that we want to tell them is that when a client has a prescription for any of these inhaled beta-2 agonists mm -hmm. and an inhaled glucocorticosteroid. So if we're giving, the thing about glucocorticoids or steroids is that if we're going to give a beta-2 agonist and a steroid, because steroids help reduce inflammation, nursing, this is very important, write it down, you must give a bronchodilator first, and then the glucocorticosteroids. Because if you give, imagine, right, you are a patient and you're having trouble breathing. The first thing we want to do is get that bronchodilator in to open up the airways. And then we want to give them the steroid to help with reducing that inflammation, okay? So we want to open the airways first and then reduce the inflammation also because the bronchodilator is going to work much faster than the glucocorticosteroid. We'd rather help them with their breathing and then reduce the inflammation than the other way around because then it might not work. So we want the bronchodilator first. Something to also watch out is when you give a patient steroids, they increase their sugar levels. So we really want to watch out for our diabetic patients when we give these medications, okay? Something else that I want to emphasize is that we want to promote bronchodilation first, and it also enhances the absorption of glucocorticosteroid, which is something if, if that helps also the explanation. So the two teaching points bronchodilator, then the steroid. And if anybody is taking glucocorticoid steroids, they really need to watch out for um, their sugar levels increasing, okay?
So this can be trouble for a diabetic patient who have already trouble with their sugar. Another thing with those steroids is that they must, teaching point that you must write down as a nurse, tell your patient they must wash their mouth or rinse their mouth after taking the steroids. Why? Because they can cause something called oral candiditis or a fungal infection in the mouth. So we want to rinse the mouth out, okay? That's something that's really, really important. But metarol and semeterol are long-acting beta-2 agonist inhalers. Remember, these are used for long-term daily maintenance. Also, same thing. You give the long-acting bronchodilator first, then the steroid. So bronchodilate, then steroid, okay? These inhalers are used every 12 hours for long-term control and are not used to abort an asthma attack. See the difference now? Like I said, same class, same adverse effect of that tachycardia and the tremors, but here's the underlying difference is that which one do we use it for, right? If it's a question and they gave you all of these drugs and they said, which one do you use for exercise-induced or asthmatic attack and they showed albuterol, salmeterol, fometerol, you know it's albuterol because it's short acting. That's where it becomes very important, right? Because this, this could be a life or death situation. Client education, follow the instructed use of the meter dose inhaler. Do not exceed the prescribed dosages. Know the dosage schedule. Um, look out for indications of impeding asthma episode. Notify the provider if there's an increase in the frequency and the intensity of asthma exacerbations. But like I said, in really, 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 really important client education, the palpitations and the tremors, right? Um, making sure you take the bronchodilator first and the steroid. Washing your mouth when you take the steroid right after. Rinse it thoroughly, okay? And those tremors and that tachycardia, really important, and knowing which one to use it for, right? And you as a nurse need to know, do I use my short-term or my long-term acting with this patient and why? Now we have anticholinergic, another reliever medication to help with an asthmatic episode or exercise-induced asthma, okay? So these are anticholinergics. As, as we said, these function on those muscarinic receptors and they block it, they're anti-SLUD. So they bronchodilate now because they kind of mimic the sympathetic nervous system and they also help reduce secretions that you might get. So that aids in asthma. So the prototype is epitropium, which I mentioned in my ANS lecture, and I'm mentioning it again here. So patients who cannot tolerate the sympathetic effects of the sympathopathomimetics, or in other words, if they can't handle those al and albuterol things like that, we're going to give them epitropium or tetrotropium. These drugs are not as effective, but can provide some relief. So it's another type, but our, our drug of choice for an asthma attack or anything like that is going to be the bronchodilators, okay? So expected pharmacological action, like I said, they block those muscarinic receptors, which means they promote bronchodilation or the ability to breathe. They relieve bronchospasms associated with COPD, right? Because it's long-term, so it can help with that. Allergen-induced and exercise-induced bronchospasms and asthma. Epitropamine is the only is only approved for bronchospasms associated with COPD, though it is often used off-label for asthma, and it is a part of evidence-based guidelines for asthma treatment. But like I said, it's can, so it can be used as a reliever for asthma, and it can also be used to reduce bronchospasms and COPD. Route is inhalation, so it works very quickly. Complications, remember, anti-SLUD. SLUD, or let's put Let's put this right over here, right? It is anti-slud. So anti-slud means salvation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, digestion. So a lot of the times, as I mentioned before, where it works is also a part of the adverse effects. So dry mouth and hoarseness is because of that lack of salvation that you get from these medications, right? So very important teaching point, they should be sucking on sugarless, sugarless hard candy. That's going to help promote salvation, okay? Contraindications. Just a rule of thumb, most drugs are contraindicated in pregnancy, so no pregnancy, okay? It's also contraindicated in clients who have allergies to peanuts because these medications can be prepared with that, okay? So use cautionly in patients who have narrow angle glaucoma, but like I said, know mainly what this drug is used for, okay? It's also good to know that there's an allergy to peanuts, right? So 
They're going to have dryness of the mouth. So what you want to teach is the patient, suck on those hard candies, okay? Other important education includes the length of time you take between puffs, okay? Like I said, if you're taking a glucocorticoid steroid, right, too, with any sort of bronchodilator, we also have to be careful with the oral candidiasis. But in these medications, we actually rinse them out after inhalation due to just an unpleasant taste. But to remember rinsing the mouth is for those glucocorticoid steroids, like I said, bronchodilate first, and then that. Then if they're not really good with the bronchodilators, then we can give them these anticholinergics, okay? So for these drugs, we want to rinse the mouth after inhalation to decrease the unpleasant taste. Make sure you wait at least five minutes in between medications, especially if they're inhaled very quickly. Do not swallow tichotropium capsules. An inhalation device is used for the administration of the capsule, okay? So it's not something that you're you're taking by mouth. Um, depending on the therapeutic intent, effectiveness is evidenced by the following. Control of the bronchospasm and prevention of allergen-induced and exercise-induced bronchospasm. So the main thing is that we're going to give them, if they can't handle those simple pathomimetics like the beta-2 agonists, we're going to give these anticholinergic drugs, which is going to help because they're relievers uh -huh. to prevent that allergen-induced bronchospasm, but it can be also used to control the bronchospasms and COPD, okay? And teaching point, because of that dry mouth, suck on those hard candies. Now we have something called leukotriene inhibitors. Let me just find that in my notes. I apologize. I used to different notes while I'm talking so I get a little confused when I'm looking for my notes um Okay, so I found my notes. So we have leukotriene inhibitors, okay? So the leukotriene inhibitors basically are, the leukotrienes are a type of inflammatory response that we also get, something that is also released that causes that inflammation that we get in asthmatic patients or even patients with COPD. So when we give these medications, these all end in leucast. So you see the Zarfalucas, Montelukas, or another one, Xyluton, okay? So we give these, they block that and helps block some of that inflammation, okay? So long story short, like I said, it's just leukotriene is a type of receptor that causes inflammation, but we block these receptors to promote a decrease in the inflammation and help with the aid of breathing, okay? So this is daily treatment. Why? Because the leukotriene modifiers is one of those controllers. The long-acting beta-2s were also the controllers, and you take that with those glucocorticosteroids, and you can also give these medications because they suppress the leukotrienes and they promote smooth muscle contract, smooth muscle constriction, which reduces that bronchoconstriction and inflammation, okay? So reducing these is a good thing. So they're required for daily treatment because remember, these are controllers working long-term, require thorough patient education, importance of taking an absence of systems. It's not a rescue medication. You see where these things start to differ? Remember, it's the class of medications and they end in Lucast. The same way you were looking at the class of the beta twos that had that metarol that TRO, like you're looking for those ending that's going to help you. So like I said, these focus on suppressing the action of the leukotrienes, which is decreases airway edema. And that is because of the fact that they decrease that smooth muscle constriction. Okay. So complications of these medications includes depression and suicidal ideation, which means you want to have 
We want to ask them, how are they feeling a lot, okay? We want to do a suicide assessment on these patients, especially if we have any sort of clues that these patients might be depressed, okay? We want to monitor for change in behavior, very important nursing action, okay? Also, you can have liver injury with the leukotriene inhibitors that end in Z. So we want to, I mean, not end in Z, sorry, let's start with Z. So... We want to also be careful with that. So we want to be cautious with patients that have liver toxicity and things like that. And that means we also want to get baseline liver function tests and monitor that very closely. Okay. So we want to watch out for, we want to tell them signs and symptoms of liver damage include nausea and erection and abdominal pain. And we must notify the provider if anything happens like that. Okay. So nursing actions, monitor those baseline um liver function test and we also then want to inform them of signs and symptoms of liver damage we also want to watch out for any changes in behavior that might indicate they're depressed or suicidal with these medications next thing is that the ones that also start with z xylutin and sulfurlucast inhibit the metabolism of warfarin now warfarin is really really important it's an anticoagulant and the reason we want to monitor these protrombin, these PT and INR levels, is because of the fact that those are our clotting times. So the clotting times help make sure that the patient is um, having an effective dose of that medication. So the higher the times are, that lets us know, okay, the medication's working. So we want to monitor PT time, write this down, 60 to 80 seconds, and INR levels, specifically INR for warfarin, especially two to three is what we want when someone's on warfarin, okay? INR needs to be two to three. So when patients are taking these medications, and if they're taking warfarin, we really want to watch out for those INR levels, and we also want to watch for signs of bleeding, because bleeding is a sign of, a sign that you expect that you a sign that you will see, sorry, if someone is on warfarin, okay? So that's another thing with these medications. The xylutin and Zarkas also inhibit theophylline, which is another drug that can be used as a controller, okay? So we have to be careful. I mean, so that means we want to monitor those theophylline levels, okay? So we want to monitor the warfarin levels because it affects warfarin. We want to monitor theophylline and... um. Lastly, the Montelukast, which is another one of these leukotriene inhibitors, concurrently used with this phenytoin, can inhibit the effect. So we don't want to give anything that can affect the indications of the Montelukast. Okay. So very important. All right. You can give Xylutin with or without food. Zafirlukast should be taken one hour before or two hours after meals. Okay. That's really, really important. Um, you usually, you should give also Xylutin one hour before or one hour after a meal. Avoid taking a Zofilucast with food, right? We just said that. Take Montelukast once daily at bedtime for exercise induced bronchospasms. Take two hours before exercise. Like I said, this is a long term. So with these type of drugs, since they're controllers, if my patient's about to exercise, I want to tell them, hey, take this two hours before you plan to do anything, you know? So that way, it will work and help reduce some of that bronchospasm, but it's not a reliever. It's not a reliever. That's why this is given two hours before, whereas if they had, still, if they had exercise and do snaps, we're not going to give them Montelukast. We're not going to give them something that's going to work in two hours. We're going to want to give them something like albuterol. Okay? So those are teaching points that you need to know as a nurse, because that's what the professors are going to test you on, Okay? The next thing that we're going to talk about is more preventative medications, okay? We have the inhaled corticosteroids. Like I said, we want to rinse that mouth because they're in increased risk of a fungal infection. Those inhaled long-acting um, beta agonists like formeterol and sumeterol or tabridulene, like I emphasized, tachycardia and palpitations, nervousness, all common symptoms of the beta agonist because of where they work in causing that sympathetic stimulation. You must give the long acting beta blockers first, not the beta blockers, sorry, the long acting beta agonist, the LBAs, LABAs, and then you give the corticosteroids. So long acting beta agonist or the bronchodilators and then the corticosteroids combination. Like I said, 
corticosteroids long acting, but you must give the long acting first. Examples of inhaled um, glucocorticosteroids include beclomethazone or an oral presnazone, but oral medications will increase the side effects, okay? So you have butanide, bucinamide, and formeterol. You see that interplay between the glucocorticosteroids and the long-acting, long-acting, because these are for long-term maintenance of asthma, okay? These are all just different types, okay? But if you do see there's an ending, cazone or nazone or cyanide, those are very common endings for um, glucocorticosteroids like hydrocortisone, methylpresnazone, presnazone, um, bethlemethazone, things like that. There's very common endings, okay? Nazone or cyanide, that lets you know it's a glucocorticosteroid, okay? So purpose, we have a reason that we give this. Like I said, it's a long-term. So glucocorticosteroids, their main purpose is to prevent inflammation and suppress airway mucus, okay? And they promote the responsiveness of beta-2 receptors. That's also why we give the bronchodilator first, then the glucocorticosteroid because it's going to promote that, okay? It's going to help enhance that effect of bronchodilating the lungs that we get from those beta-2 agonists, okay? So they reduce the mucosa in the airway to help with that edema, but it doesn't provide immediate effects. That's exactly why we don't give these in exacerbations or acute attacks, and that is also why we give the bronchodilator first, okay? Therapeutic uses, they're used for status anatomicus, okay? They're used for inhaled agents for long-term prophylactis of asthma, okay? Short-term oral therapy is used to treat manifestations following an acute asthmatic episode. Long-term oral therapy is used to treat chronic asthma, promote lung maturity and decrease respiratory distress, and fetuses at risk for preterm birth, okay? But like I said, these are mainly used for long-term. They can be used, but they're not immediate acting. So they're not used in situations. Short-term IV agents could help, right? For something like that severe life-threatening status automaticus, because that's a very, very severe and life-threatening. It's rare, but it can happen when someone has asthma. So if we give it through the IV, it could help with that inflammation. But like I said, mainly it's not used to treat an asthma attack, okay? Complications. Beclomethazone, presnazone is the oral glucocorticosteroid. Beclomethazone is an inhale. Like I said, rinse the mouth. Very, very, very important. That is going to definitely be on your test. And it's going to be one question that you got right because you knew that if I give my patient a steroid like beclomethazone, presnazone, whatever, whatever zone it is, hydrocortisone, flucosone, whatever. I'm going to tell them to rinse their mouth, okay? You want to monitor for redness, sores, and white patches and report them because that's a sign of oral candiditis. So we want to teach them the signs. If you have little white patches in your mouth, please tell me so we can not give you that anymore and do something else, okay? So signs and symptoms that also these can cause, like I said, steroids, remember another teaching point, they increase sugar levels. They increase sugar levels. They can delay wound tailing and they can increase the risk for infections, okay? They also can affect your bones, and they can suppress the adrenal gland, which means we might want to keep a growth and development chart, especially if it's for a younger person, okay? And electrolyte and fluid disturbances and things like that. But that hyperglycemia that you get and the oral candiditis are the most important thing. Like I said, teaching point is going to raise your sugar levels, especially watching out with those diabetic patients, okay? Because they were going to raise your sugar levels. And when you learn about diabetic medications, you're going to see that you don't want to take these medications, those medications with steroids. So we would press the zone. We do not want to give pass the uh, potassium depleting diuretics because it increases the risk of hypokalemia. So glucocorticosteroids can cause hypokalemia. So we don't want that. So as a teaching point, if it can cause hypokalemia, 
or low potassium levels, that means you want to monitor the potassium levels and administer supplements as needed. We also don't want to use them with NSAIDs because they increase the risk of GI ulceration. Like they said, some things that can be caused is peptic ulcer disease. So we don't want to do that. We also said something that it can cause is fluid and electrolyte stuff. So you see how all this kind of keeps coming out again? Concurrent use of glucocorticoid steroids and hypoglycemic agents counteract the effects. So we need to be careful. Hypoglycemic agents like our diabetic drugs, we really got to be careful. So remember with these drugs, oral candiditis, rinse them out. This class of drugs, the class with this class of drugs, we want to watch out for those potassium levels. With this class of drugs, we want to watch out for GI ulceration. And these class of drugs, we want to watch out for those high sugar levels, okay? Especially with those diabetic patients. Next, we have injective, injected preventative therapies, like the monoclonal antibodies. Like I said, they work on those IgE, those inflammatory receptors like um, Amazul. I don't know how to say that, but the Zumad, they all end in this zoo or MAD ending. So that's how you're going to remember this, okay? So this is something that you give sub-Q every two to four weeks, and it lowers the Ig antibodies, okay, which is really, really good, okay? And methyl exanes is theophylline. It has a narrow therapeutic index, which means that you have to monitor blood lab values very carefully because they can have a higher risk for adverse effects, okay? Because it's only in a short little range in which this drug can be considered safe. When it goes out of that range, we have some serious side effects, okay? So like I said, the rescue medications, rescue, just a summary, short-acting SABAs, that's our number one go-to. Then anticholinergics, like we said, those IV corticosteroids, if they have that status asthmaticus, which is that life-threatening asthmatic attack that causes severe edema and inflammation, but and epinephrine too, but like I said, drug of choice, especially during an asthma attack, is that short-acting inhale, then the anticholinergic, and maybe some IV corticosteroid, but like I said, those SBAs like albuterol, okay, or le levobuterol. Late phase asthma treatment, right? So these are the ones that we give when, you know, they have acute asthma exacerbations or close monitoring. This is emergency room like treatment. You know, we really want to watch these patient and different patient teaching. It depends on what they have. Okay. Like I said, remember which ones the relievers, which ones the controllers, the relievers, the main ones are the short acting beta agonists. And then the anticholinergics So you could use epinephrine and IV corticosteroids, but all the rest of them and all these other drug classes that we're getting into, like the long-term beta twos, generally the glucocorticosteroids, these mont uh, the leukotriene inhibitors, now these IgE antibody things, all that are for long term, okay? Now chronic COPD, okay, another type of very common and NCLEX S respiratory uh disease, okay? So it, it comes from em emphysema and chronic bronchitis, okay? But it's an interplay of those two things. And um they're very oxygen dependent, okay? But we have to be careful because oxygen can be very toxic to them, okay? But we can, we might be able to give them antibiotics, take smoking cessation, nonetheless. But some of the ones that we can give for so smoking cessation for these patients, a uh, common risk factor for COPD is smoking, is we can give bupropion, which is an antidepressant, but also helps with smoking or nicotine receptor agonists, okay? Um, they're effective, um, but we don't really want to give e-cigarettes, okay? We want to do something else, if anything, okay? So like I said, overall, going into your drug classes, like I looked into that thing, the summary is that review, you could review chapter 18 in the ATI, but overall, what I'm going to emphasize is those relievers versus the controllers, when you give what, and if you know that, then you're good to go, and that's all I have to say. If you have any questions, you can email me.